And the book of Judges opens up and it tells us that the people have quit following God. They've quit following God. In fact, according to Judges chapters 1 and 2, the people have fallen into what we call a sin cycle. They've abandoned God. And because of that, God places them into bondage. He sends somebody to oppress them so that what would happen is is that they would cry out. And they'd cry out to God, God, rescue us. And then God would send a deliverer. The problem is, is that in this book, that cycle continues over and over and over again. The people abandon God and he places them into bondage. They cry out and he sends a deliverer. The people abandon God. They get put in bondage. They cry out and he sends a deliverer. We've seen it happen twice so far. The first guy was Othniel. Othniel's name literally means the power of God. And Caleb talked about that God is the only power, not only that we need, but that exists in order to break the sin cycle. That's it. And so Othniel broke the bondage that the people were in. But as soon as Othniel left, as soon as he died, the people went back and abandoned God again. And God placed them right back into bondage. And so they cried out and God raised up Ehud. Ehud, the left-handed assassin. And he comes in and he kills the king. And by the way, I think one of the most interesting details that one of the commentaries I read talked about, he probably escaped down the poop chute. <laughs> yeah. That's what every good hero does, right? I don't think so. Um, So we've seen two. And then at the very end of chapter 3, we meet a third judge. We meet him. His name in verse 31 is Shamgar. And this is what the Bible says about him. He says, he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. What? How many of you know what an ox goad is? Yeah. It is like the handle of an axe. Right? So it's the piece that they would take and they would use it to goad the, to prod the ox to go on. And so it's this long handle and he slew 600 Philistines with it. That's an amazing story. But that's all we got on him. That's all there is on Shamgar. We all get to go home early because that's all there is today. Oh, you, okay. All right. I guess I'll go a little bit further. We'll just go into chapter 4 and we'll move on to the next judge. So let's read together. If you've got your Bible, starting in verse 1. And it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud had died. So here it is. They start the cycle all over again. They're abandoning God. And so the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. He reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in a really, really hard word that none of us are going to be able to say, so we'll just go with HH. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Listen to that. They cried out again. Because he, that being Sisera, had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. All right, I want to pause for just a second. So here it is. Ehud, the left-handed assassin. After he assassinates the king and leads Israel to victory, he actually helps judge them and lead them peacefully for the longest time frame, 80 years. So there was peace in the land for 80 years. But after he dies, again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They abandoned God. And so God turns them over to their enemy. This time, it's a little bit different enemy. It's Jabin, king of Canaan. And he has a mighty commander. That commander's name is Sisera. But here's what I wanted to point out. It took 20 years before the Israelites cried out. It took 20 years before the Israelites cried out. Do you know that before Othniel, when they were put into oppression the very first time, into bondage the first time, it took eight years before they cried out. 
The second time before Ehud was raised up, it took 18 years before they cried out. And this time, it was 20 years. Here's what I want you to know. If you're writing notes, write this down. The longer we are in the sin cycle, the more comfortable we become with it. Let that sink in for just a second. The longer we are in the sin cycle, the more comfortable we become with it. Why in the world did the Israelites not just cry out the moment that Jabin showed up on their doorstep? I think it's the same reason that you and I don't cry out the moment that sin shows up at ours. We think, and they thought, we can handle it all on our own. We're strong enough to take care of this. We can do it. And so here's what they did. They put their heads down, and they tried to press on as if nothing was wrong. Until finally, finally, they'd had enough and realized they couldn't do it on their own, and they cried out. You know, some of us, some of us have been in our own sin cycles so long that we don't know if there's any way out. We've put our head down. We've tried to do it on our own. However we can. And eventually that sin cycle becomes all that we've ever known. It's all that we ever remember. We hear people who talk about being free. But those stories just seem like just that. Stories. Because if those people knew my life, there's no way that they could possibly be free of the same thing that I'm struggling with, that I'm dealing with. And so we just keep our heads down. And we keep pushing ahead, never crying out, never asking for help. But here's what I want you to know. That when we cry out, God always does something surprising. Check out what happens when the Israelites cried out. Verse 4. It says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, were all men. They were all men. And so we come to this and we expect that when Israel cries out that God's going to raise up and send another man in in order to help them out. And instead, instead we find this surprising verse 4 where it says, now Deborah. Now Deborah. Listen, in case you're confused, it's a woman. Listen, there is no way that this name could be construed as anything else. You can't go, well, maybe they just had some like male name that was similar to this, and so it was really a guy. No, no, no. The name Deborah, not only was it in the feminine form, but it literally means the woman, the queen bee. She is a woman, all woman. That's all it can mean. And in case we get confused, the very next word, which we would translate prophet, is in the feminine form, which means a prophetess. Hmm. So, here it is, Deborah. God sends in Deborah to judge Israel. Now, by the way, I laughed at one of the commentators. He was trying to lessen the idea of a female prophetess, a female judge over Israel. And so he said this. He said, by saying the word judge, judge was synonymous with leader. I remember he was trying to lessen this idea of who it was that was leading here. And I laughed because I was like, oh, so what he was saying is they had a female leader right now. Okay, very good. Who knows? We could have a Deborah in our future as a country pretty soon, maybe next election. Who knows? But 
It has often been said this, when men are not doing the job, God will raise up a woman. Thank you, ladies. I thought that might get some, some claps from you guys. I don't know if that's true or not. All right. I don't know if that's true or not. But I can tell you that he is certainly using one here. And as I was studying this week, I came to a love and respect a lot about Deborah. Right? And I want to point out just a couple of things about her for just a second. Here's the first one. She's given the title of a prophetess. A prophetess. In other words, she knew God's word. She knew God's word so well that she could use it to guide and instruct other people. That's what a prophetess is. They used God's word in order to guide and instruct others about how to follow God. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. She's the wife of Lapidus. She was not only a leader, an instructor of the nation, but she was still submissive to a husband. She managed this incredible home and work life balance. That is not an easy thing to do. But here it is, God honors that. By the way, a little bit later on, we're going to meet a guy named Barak. What we don't see is an epithet right after, a Barak, uh, after Barak's name that says, the husband of Michelle. <laughs> Some of you got that. But it is important to note that God was saying that she was both a leader and a follower at the same time. And that is an important thing. It's not an easy thing to do, but really, all great leaders should also be great followers. Here's the third thing I want you to notice. She had her own tree. Right? Did you catch that? She had her own tree. She was sitting underneath the Deborah palm. By the way, if you want to find me this next week, I've picked out my palm tree. It's up by the South Lake. I'll have a hammock underneath there. And I promise I'll be telling you and instructing you about God's word from the Charles palm from now on. All right? Wow. Actually, I really love the juxtaposition of this line. You see, Deborah is sitting underneath her palm tree at the same moment that Sisera, the commander, the captain, the chief of 900 chariots, is sitting at the head of his army. Talk about a contrast between the two things. One is sitting underneath a palm tree. The other is sitting with 900 chariots at his back. I wonder who's going to win this fight. It seems from the very outset that Israel is significantly outmatched. Now before I go any further, I, wanna, I just want to warn you about this passage for just a second. This passage has been abused by lots of people on both sides of the spectrum. In fact, I read hundreds, hundreds of misusage of this passage in preparation for this morning. This passage is not designed to say that women are better than men. It's not what this passage is trying to say. We already know that. But this passage... This passage is not about the roles that men and women play inside of the church. That is not what is going on here. And we can't take this description and make it a prescription of that sort of a thing. Although there are those who have tried. But this passage, this passage does talk about the fact that Deborah, Deborah knew the Bible. She knew God's word. She understood it. She understood how to apply it, not only in her own life, but in somebody else's life. She understood that she was supposed to instruct others who came to her seeking advice. Listen, it is our job. It is our job as followers of Jesus to know the Bible. 
It is our job to be able to apply it into our lives. But we're also supposed to take it one step further because it's not just for us. It wasn't left as an us for and no more sort of a thing. It's a good thing we have more than four out here today. But it's designed for us to help others to apply it to their lives and to use it. And Deborah understood that. Listen, there is nothing better that you could pray daily than to say, God, help me not only to apply your word in my own life, but help me to instruct others around me in truth and in love so that they could follow you too. That is a God-honoring prayer. Let's continue on with the story. So Deborah, Deborah is now there judging, and she is moved by God to call a man named Barak. And she enlists him to lead an army, an army that Barak will build. And Barak balks at this. In fact, read with me. It says it in verse 8. He says, Barak said to her, if you'll go with me, I'll go. But if you'll not go with me, I will not go. Okay, so saying that Barak balks is really not entirely fair of him, right? Because the whole inspiration for this entire series came out of a verse that's found in Hebrews chapter 11. It's verse 32, and it says this. It says, what more shall I say? This is the We think maybe Paul was writing it, but the writer at Hebrews has been writing a long list of all of those that are amazing faith heroes. And he says, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, whose name is that? Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah. The writer of Hebrews names four different judges, and he says that they have an incredible faith. So much faith that they make it into the hall of fame of faith. But right here, right here, Barak seems to drop the ball. He seems to drop the ball. You know, as I was doing some reading this week, I ran across a story from the 1941 World Series. Now, they happen to have my Yankees inside of the World Series, which always makes it a much, much better story. But in 1941, the Yankees were playing the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was the first time that they had what was called a Subway Series, that both teams were right there. You go back and forth. And it was an incredibly tight battle. In fact, game one, the Yankees won by one run. Game two, the Yankees lost by one run. Game three, the Yankees won again by one run. It was back and forth and back and forth. And in game four, in the bottom of the ninth inning, with two outs, Yankee batter was up. And they'd brought in, Brooklyn Dodgers had brought in their closing pitcher. And he throws this nasty curveball. The count is already full. And the Yankees batter swings, and he misses completely. Strike! And the umpire doesn't say anything else. Because the ball hit the catcher. His name was Mickey Owens. It hit the heel of his glove and spun down and out to the backstop. And the Yankees batter took off to first base, and he made it there safely. The Yankees went on to rally and to win game four and turned around and won game five and won the series four games to one. Mickey Owens is where we get the term he dropped the ball from. Mickey Owens is a Hall of Fame baseball catcher. In fact, that year he'd only made four mistakes four errors it was the fifth one of the entire season 162 games 
with over 150 pitches pitched in every single one of those games, five times he made a mistake. I love that story as I found it this week as I was reading because here was a guy who dropped the ball and yet he's still a Hall of Famer. That one moment didn't define who he was. But here it is. Barack seems to, to continue the idiom for just a second, take his eye off of the ball. He asks Deborah to go with him. Now why in the world, why in the world did he ask Deborah to go with him? Here's why. Number one, he knew that she knew God. He knew that she knew God. Number two, she represented God. You see, the Israelites, as they had gone into battle with Joshua, had taken into the battles with them the Ark of the Covenant. And when the Ark of the Covenant was there, it was God's blessing over what was going on, and they were victorious and won the battle. And so Barak was saying, as the representative of God, will you come and just show everybody that God is with us? Barak believed that what he needed in order to be victorious in this battle was Deborah. Do you see where he misplaced and took his eye off the ball? He thought what he needed was Deborah. He falsely believed that that's what he needed to be victorious. Here's the second thing if you're taking notes today. As we face our enemies and struggle with our sin, we develop lots of false beliefs. As we face our enemies and struggle with our sin, we develop lots of false beliefs. I think athletes may be the worst at this, right? We are superstitious about everything. If we get a hitting streak going to continue on in baseball, right, we won't change our underwear. That'll definitely keep a streak going. And I don't mean a hitting streak. But listen, when you are facing the enemy, you are sold lots of different things as to why and what you need to do in order to be victorious. You ever been flipping the channels and you hear the preacher that say, hey, if you want to be victorious in your battles, you just send me more money. I've heard them. And there's tons of people who believe that that's what they need in order to be victorious over the sin that's in their lives. Or if you'll just try harder, if you'll just commit to this fast, if you'll commit to just pray more, if you'll just fill in the blank with whatever, whether it's being more disciplined, if it's being more money-making, if it's whatever. It doesn't mean that all of those things are bad things. Having Deborah with him was not a bad thing. But it placed all of the glory in the wrong place. It placed all of his faith in that moment in the wrong place place and here's the problem with all of those roads they all lead they all lead to our own glory if it's something that you can do then you get all the glory if it's something that you can do you get all of the glory because you controlled the outcome we controlled the outcome by what it is that we did and in the end And in the end, here's why all of those things are failures. Because we cannot change human nature. It's an impossibility. It's not something that we can do. We are not capable of defeating our sin on our own. We cannot control sin. It doesn't matter if it's a little small sin. Or if it's a huge sin, we cannot control sin. You know, I love Deborah's response, though. She doesn't blast him. 
She doesn't look at Barak and go, Barak, what are you doing? Instead, what she does is she comes alongside of him. And she lovingly says to him, yes, I'm going to go with you. She doesn't call him out for being weak. This is the second way that this passage gets abused because lots of times pastors get up and they say, look, Deborah, strong, man, weak. And you know what? I love that she doesn't rebuke him because God doesn't rebuke our weaknesses either. God is not upset about our inability to defeat sin. He knows it about us. He knows that we can't do it. And here's what he does. He honors our desire to defeat it. He honors our desire to defeat it. He's gladdened by it. But watch Deborah's next words. She says, but the glory, the glory will not be yours. You know, I think if I'm honest about it, I struggle with this. Struggle with this idea of glory. I'm going to make a statement, and you may struggle with this statement as much as I do, but God is always in it for the glory. Whoa, that doesn't sound like a good God for a second, does it? But God is always in it for His own glory. Listen, God did not redeem me because of me. God did it for His own glory. God didn't redeem you because of you. He did it for His own glory. Glory. God doesn't defeat sin because of us. He did it for His own glory. God is always in it for His own glory. And in this moment, God moves the victory away from Brock. He says, you don't have any glory in this moment. And Deborah tells this prophetic statement and says it will be in the hands of a woman. Now, I I sort of wonder if right here, if Deborah thought that God was going to give her the victory. I wonder if that's what she was thinking when she said this, if she was like, I'm going with him, so I'm going to be the one who gets all of the glory. So Deborah and Barak go off and they recruit an army together and they set a plan in motion. And as they're doing that, in the midst of this plan, we get this new verse, this new piece of information that seems totally out of place. But God was setting something up, and we find out that God moves a family, a family which includes a work-from-home mom, a stay-at-home mom. Her job was being mom. I love that. So in this story, God uses a mom who works outside of the house and one who works in the house. Only God can do that. This incredible balance where he can use both sides of the spectrum and one is not better than the other because both were bringing glory and honor to him. And then God sets the battlefield. Sisera comes out and he comes to battle with his 900 chariots made of iron and in chapter four we don't really find out what happens other than we all of a sudden hear that Barak is routing the enemy and Sisera has to get off of his high horse and flee on foot but in chapter five the song of Deborah and Barak we find out that there's this incredible miracle that happens. Similar to when Moses was getting ready to face off with Pharaoh and the Red Sea was behind him and he crossed over on dry land because God held back the waters and when the Egyptians came across, the waters came crashing down on them. God sends this magnificent storm into the valley where the battle was taking place. Think about June in Arizona. There are no storms that happen in June in Arizona. 
You can drive anywhere you want in June in Arizona. You can go out to the riverbed out here and drive up and down the riverbed with no fear of water because there isn't any. It was June in Arizona when Sisera entered into this battlefield. And here's what happened. God sent this gigantic monsoon. And all of a sudden, the chariots, which were his ace, his trump card to take out all of the Israelites, began to get stuck in the mud. And they couldn't go anywhere. And instead of being something that was their strength, it became their weakness. And they were mowed down by the Israelites. And Sisera, realizing that the battle is lost, jumps out and he runs away on foot. The only thing that he can possibly do. And he shows up at this family's house, a tent. Family that had been friendly to their cause. He asks for, for shelter and a drink of water. And a woman named J.L. invites him in. She gives him milk. And he takes it and he drinks it and he lays down. And as he's fast asleep, J.L. walks over. And she takes a tent peg and a hammer and she drives it through his temple. In fact, it tells us that she drives it until it goes into the ground on the other side. Sisera is dead. And victory has come. I love this. Because even though she was blessed in the song, all of the glory went back to God. You see, God not only has the power, like we talked about in Othniel, God not only has the position like we talked about with Ehud, but God deserves the praise for defeating sin in our lives. I want to give you one final thought before we go. I was reading an article that I'll put up on our Facebook page tomorrow about what happens when we give God praise that he is due. And it shared this idea, and I love it, and I thought it applied so well to today. It says, when we choose to let God have the glory, when we give him all of the praise, it breaks the cycle of self-absorption that engulfs us and entangles us and emotionally char uh, damages those that are around us. When we give God the glory, it changes everything. Listen, God desires to break the sin cycle in our lives. He desires to break it in your life, in my life, but we have to be willing. We have to be willing to give him the praise instead. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that 2,000 years ago, you sent Jesus. And God, all of this as we're reading about the fact that you're the one who has the power, you gave all of that authority to Jesus, and he's the one who broke sin forever. He was the judge that Israel was waiting for, and God, he's the one that is judging and leading my life. God, I pray maybe there's somebody that's out there today that they, if they're honest with themselves, would say, I live in that sin cycle. I find myself abandoning God and trying to do things my own way. And if I'm honest, I'm weighed down by the bondage of all of that sin in my life. God, your word has told us if we'll just cry out, you've already sent the deliverer and his name is Jesus.
Friend, if that's you, if you are not free, don't leave here still a slave. At the end, I'll be in the back. And together we can talk about what it means to make Jesus the one who's in charge of your life. God, we just continue to give you all of the glory and all of the honor. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.